Hello everyone, my name is Mark Temple, I'm an academic at Western Sydney University and I'd just like to put together a short video to describe how we amplify DNA in the laboratory. So effectively it's basically how does a PCR reaction work. So PCR is a polymerase chain reaction, we could just refer to it as PCR. So it's an important reaction because if you, it, it's, it's not a linear amplification of DNA, it's a chain reaction, meaning that each time you go through this circular process of amplifying, you get a doubling of the product rather than plus one, which would be kind of a linear. You know. So with a doubling, if you double something 20 times, if you do the maths, you'll end up with about a million copies of that thing. So doubling something 20 times is much more powerful than simply making 20 copies of something if you run a cycle 20 times. So that's what we're going to talk about today. PCR, it's not complicated, but you need to have a bit of an understanding of DNA and complementary base pairing between DNA strands because during a PCR reaction we use primers and primers are just short sequences of DNA which have to bind to single-stranded DNA to form short regions of double-stranded DNA and then from that short region of DNA we extend and amplify uh, and copy the template. Okay, So you need to have a little bit of an understanding of how DNA um, binds and this concept melting temperature, how you um, get specific binding between two DNA sequences. And then I'll just run through some of the uh, properties of the thermal cycling reaction. So we have a PCR machine where we put our DNA and our, our polymerase and our enzymes and, you know, in, in these tubes. And then we run through a heat cycle. So I'll explain a bit about the thermal cycling procedure during a PCR reaction. And I'll also have a look about some of the properties of the primer so we can think about um, how to design and um, optimize your primers so that they work in, in a PCR reaction. Okay, so let, let, let's begin. So on, on the screen here, I've, I've represented a, um, a region of DNA and it's shown here as a single strand. Okay, but we all know DNA is a double-stranded molecule. Um, when you write DNA as a single strand, it implies what the sequence of the other strand is because we, we understand complementary base pairing. So whenever we see a, um, a G in the um, top strand, we know that on the other strand there will be a complementary base which would be a C because there are, um, yeah, that's just the way DNA works. So whenever there's a C, we're going to have a G, and whenever there's an A, we're going to have a T, and um, so on. Okay, so we can predict the structure of the other strand simply by looking at um, one strand. So when you download DNA sequences from databases, you often download them as single-stranded read. And the DNA is always written in the five prime to three prime direction here. So um, if you remember, um, D DNA has a sugar phosphate backbone with the bases hanging off the sugars. And if you look at the, the, the sugar phosphate backbone, at the five prime end, the phosphate is attached to the five prime of the sugar. And at the three prime end, the phosphate is attached to the three prime end of the sugar. And that's just how the strand is, um, it, 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 it exists. Okay, So we always write down DNA in, in one orientation, although the other strand clearly goes in the opposite direction. Okay, Because if you remember your your DNA here. So, um, so, so if you're thinking about how a PCR works, we, we use a DNA polymerase to copy a strand of DNA. Now, how does DNA polymerase works? How does it work? If this is your polymerase, and this is the bit of DNA that you want to copy, and this is your template strand, um, this is the five prime end of the primer, and this is the three prime end of the primer. And it's the three prime end of the primer that is extended by the polymerase used during a PCR reaction. So um, if this was an A here, the polymerase would add a T. If this was a G here, you would add a C. And if this was a T, you'd add an A. And if this was a C, you would add a G. And it would basically, the polymerase simply copies the um, template strand to make a complementary um, strand. Okay, so the sequence that's being made 
in f- from from the forward direction is complementary to the strand being copied. Okay, so it's important to, to um, be aware of which is the three prime end and the five prime end of the the DNA sequences because of the way the polymerase works to extend the DNA. Um, Although most databases represent DNA in single-stranded form, I'm more keen to look at DNA as as a double-stranded molecule because it's easier to think about what's happening during the extension of both strands rather than just considering one strand. So I've taken that DNA sequence that went, the top strand that went from the five prime to the three prime direction, which was, which recall was from here. And now we're showing the complementary strand which runs in this direction. Okay? So let's assume I want to amplify this region of DNA from maybe um, about here through to, I don't know, somewhere around here. Okay? So that's the block of DNA. I want to make a PCR product that consists of that region of DNA. So basically, I need to design a primer somewhere in this vicinity here and a primer somewhere in this vicinity here. Okay, so this is a forward primer and this would be the reverse primer. Now, the forward primer would be same sequence as that and the reverse primer would be the same sequence as that. So, um, as I've shown um, in this slide here, let's assume this is our forward primer and let's assume this is our reverse primer. Okay, so if, if you want to write down those primer sequences and order them from you know a company to start doing your, your your PCR reaction, then this primer is written in the five prime to three prime direction, so you would simply um, send off that sequence. This primer here is um, is written it, as we read it off the screen, it goes G A G C blah blah blah, but that's reading in the three to five direction. It's the wrong way. We actually want to read it um, from the we always read DNA from five to three. So to write down that sequence, I would write down um, T, then the G, G. Okay, so I've effectively write it, writing it in that direction, which is five to three. So when you order your primers, this primer just matches the, the top strand exactly, whereas the bottom primer is the reverse of the complementary sequence. So if this is the strand of DNA you're looking at, you've got to turn it into the complementary sequence, which is this. And then from that complementary sequence, you reverse it to get the reverse complement of the top strand. Okay. So when you look at um, your um, sequence here, then these, these two primers would be the primers that you would order from the shop, Okay, which is this one and this one. All right. Okay, so once you've got your primers and you've designed your primers, we'll talk more about primer design later, but once you've got your primers and you want to start thinking about how the PCR reaction works, well, a PCR reaction is fairly straightforward in terms of what happens in the thermal cycler. We basically run through multiple um, cycles of denaturation, annealing, and extension. Okay, so denaturation means we separate the strands of DNA, or we melt the strands of DNA. Annealing means that we um, allow the primers to settle and bind to the DNA sequence, and we want that to be specifically at a certain spot. So we have to um, do that as be very careful at the temperature at which we anneal the primer to the DNA sequence, and then we extend the primer from the three prime end um, um, along the template strand. And because we're using a thermophilic DNA polymerase, it, it operates at high temperature, its optimum temperature is 72 degrees. So typically we don't really change that much. We tend to do our extension reactions at 72 degrees. We tend to d- d- denature at around 94, 95, 96 degrees, depending on what you're trying to achieve. And the annealing temperature is based on the primer sequence. Not just the sequence, the length and the characteristics of of the primer. So we're gonna run through this process maybe 20 or 30 times in a a thermocycler and that will denature the DNA, 
anneal the primers, extend the primers, separate the strands, anneal the primers, extend the primers, separate the strands, yada yada. And just keep going through that process. So let's just represent on the screen here this process of denaturing, annealing, and extending. So the first thing we do is we heat the genomic DNA to separate the strands. And it's more difficult to separate the genomic DNA than it is to separate the PCR products because the genomic DNA is many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of base pairs of DNA, all sort of um, complementary bound. So you've, you've got to put enough heat in the system to really separate those two long strands so that the primers can then get into the double-stranded DNA, and, and which is now single-stranded DNA, and, and bind. So um, often the first denaturation step is much longer than the subsequent steps because you now you're working from genomic DNA in the first round. So the first thing we do is denature the template um, DNA. Um, the next thing we do is anneal the primers. So um, if you look at, remember we've got this forward primer represented in green and this red primer represented in, uh, the, the, the reverse primer represented in red. Don't forget that the forward primer binds to the bottom strand because it's complementary to the bottom strand. It's identical in sequence to the top strand, but it's complementary to the bottom strand. And likewise, the reverse sequence that we use to design the reverse primer from the bottom strand, it's complementary to the top strand. So it binds to the top strand because the sequence is the same as the bottom strand. Okay, so we'll then go through um, an extension reaction where um, the three prime end of each primer is extended. Okay, and if you remember, the three prime end of the primer is where the polymerase is going to um, function, and then the polymerase is able to read through the sequence and make a copy. Okay, so if we look at what's happened here, the, um, the forward primer here has extended along the strand to make a strand of DNA that is identical to this. Okay, and the reverse primer, which was here, has extended along the top strand to make a sequence which is identical to this. Okay, okay so, um, and then once we've done this once, it's simply repeated, okay, again and again and again for between 20 and 35 cycles, depending on um, the, what you're trying to achieve. All right, we've been looking at a DNA sequence in sort of this tiny little region at base pair level. So let's kind of zoom out a little to look at a DNA sequence at, at, a, at a more um, realistic level. So somewhere in there, we want a primer to bind to a specific sequence. All right, so when we're doing the first round of the PCR reaction, we denature the strands as I showed earlier. We then um, anneal the primers and we design the annealing step so that it's specifically at the region we want and I'll talk about that later. What we want in a PCR reaction is this to extend to there and this to extend to there. That's because that's the product we want. But during the first round of a PCR reaction, this primer here just keeps reading as long as it can read, as long as there's template sequence and the, the extension still running, these primers will just keep reading, right? So during the first round of a PCR reaction, we're not actually generating that small product. We're just generating um, these sort of um, first round synthesis products that are really long. And each time you go through a, a cycle in a PCR reaction, so if you do it 20 times, you're going you're gonna to get 20 of these long read copies of, of um, genomic DNA. And you, you don't want them. These are not the PCR reaction, but it's important because it's the start of amplifying the DNA. But these aren't the products we want, okay? So to denature these strands and then enter the second round of a PCR reaction. So now we have additional places where the, um, the, the primers can anneal. So, and again, we're going to um, extend these products and Again, like I was um, indicating earlier, we've got um, 
another copy of these and we're going to get one copy of those for every cycle so we'll end up with 20 copies of those uh, but now we're starting to get some smaller products of the right length okay and these will then enter the, the PCR reaction and the reason we can amplify these in, in a non-linear way is because each strand of the product um, can be re-amplified on, on, during its, each cycle okay so in the third round we denature all these products again and then we anneal the primers okay so each copy of that short product can bind a primer so when we amplify this we get a doubling so so we get a new copy of that and we get a new copy of that so that's a doubling of the product so during the fourth round of a PCR reaction we just simply repeat this process and generate some more product okay so let's start to focus on these short regions of DNA all right and let's forget about what's happening um, with the um, those long extension products which are amplifying linearly so we're not getting uh, multiple products of these these are the things here that we want to focus on in the fourth round let's assume we've got eight copies in the fifth round we're going to denature all of those extend all of those and make double copies and then repeat through this procedure so that each cycle doubles the number of copies all right so if you do if you follow through the maths you know we've got 8 16 32 64 128 256 um, 512 and we just keep working through and you're getting a doubling all right and at some point in this process we're going to end up after 20 cycles with about a million copies it's you know these are just estimates you know it, it's not actually you know a million copies but it, it's a rough ballpark of, of, of what we'll what we hope is in the tube at the end of the PCR reaction all right so just work through this doubling and redoubling every time and we end up with, with a large copy now don't forget the um, single strand synthesis of the genomic DNA those sort of long um, strands you after 20 cycles we're going to have we're only going to have 20 copies of those but for the short PCR products because we get a doubling every time then we're just simply doubling um, up as I've shown here and we end up with a large number after 20 cycles and depending on the efficiency of the reaction and how much template you had and you know then you, you may keep going for um, more cycles or you, you may decide that you have enough DNA in the tube okay so we, we've discussed um, how the, the thermal cycling works and how um, the, the, the doubling of the DNA works during the, um, the, the, the process let's have a little think now about how we anneal those primers to DNA because the template DNA is often very complex DNA, meaning there's a lot of different sequences possible uh, across the hundreds of thousands and millions of base pairs. So, um, so, so how does this short primer um, specifically sort of um, recognize the, a, a sequence that's unique rather than a sequence that's almost right but not quite right? Okay, because there's lots of variations of DNA sequence in, in, in the template. So l let's firstly think about there's two concepts here. We're thinking about the annealing step and the specificity. So let's quickly just look at the annealing temperature and then we'll discuss specificity. So in this little diagram here, I'm showing template DNA here, all right? And this is just a really short, you know, it's a bit silly really, it's too short, but here's just a short primer. And what I'm showing here is the complementary base pairing between the the two strands so whenever there's a an a in the template we have to design a primer with a t in it and whenever there's a g in the template we design a primer with a c in it now each time there's a t there are two watson creek base pairs between the um, annealed dna and the template uh, primer and the template so and whenever there's a, a gc in the primer then there's three watson creek base pairs and you know, we, we want to know at what temperature this thing 
is going to effectively um, bind to the DNA. And we want to bind it at the... Um, the we, we want to run the reaction hot so that non-specific binding is excluded. All right. So, so if we're looking at this sequence here, then we can do a simple calculation of the melting temperature just by looking at the number of Watson Creek base pairs between the primer and the template DNA sequence. So in this case, we have 2, 4, 7, 10, 13, 15, 18. So we just add up those numbers and we get um, a, a number of 18 and the, it, that, that estimates the melting temperature at 18 degrees. Now, there are much more sophisticated and better ways to do estimation of melting temperature or annealing temperature, but when you're just working quickly and you're having a think about things, then this is a rough estimate. All right? And um, the, the, the best measure of what the, the best um, annealing temperature is, is often empirical. You actually do the experiment and you, you choose the temperature that works best. But it's normally quite close to the estimated melting temperature. Okay, so here's a more realistic primer. And this primer is somewhere, I, I forget the length, it's about 18 or 20 base pairs. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. So this is a 24 mer, if I've counted it right. And um, I've, I've just done the addition of the um, Watts Creek base pairing, and I've estimated it's got a melting temperature of 60. So why have I used a longer primer sequence here? The reason I've used a longer primer sequence is that genomic DNA is a much more complex sequence than um, you know short um, plasmid sequences. So if the gene I want to amplify or the bit of DNA I want to amplify is that region there, then we're, we're designing primers to match the, um, the ends of that sequence. But this sequence here might be really similar to another sequence here. Not the same, but similar. So that means that this primer, whilst it's going to bind here specifically, it will bind loosely there. And there might be another sequence up here where that primer might loosely bind. So it's got a little bit of complementarity, enough to, to bind, okay? So at a low temperature, you'll have all three of these things bound to the DNA. But as you push the temperature closer and closer to this, these things fall away and they melt, okay? So that is effectively um, gone, um, all right? So at a higher temperature, then the, the, this one is still attached and, and complementary base pairing, but these ones that were loosely bound have fallen away. So now the polymerase can extend this one, this one doesn't get extended, and this one doesn't get extended. So you need a long sequence for the specificity of the primer against the complex template DNA. And once you've got a longer sequence, you then need to have a higher temperature to melt away the um, poorly um, matched sequences because they will still bind to DNA at low temperatures because there's a bit of complementarity there. But as you raise the temperature, then you're really putting a lot of pressure on this one which will stay attached, but these ones will fall away. All right, and then that's how we get specificity in the PCR reaction. So, so, so to sort of talk more about that issue, as you can see here, I've I've got the set. This primer here is identical in sequence to this primer, and it's identical in sequence to this primer. Okay, now this primer here has identified another region of the template that's very similar to this, but it's different, but it's very similar, okay? But in this case here, I'm, I'm, I'm indicating that there's no complementarity between the primer and the template. And also in this region here, there's no complementarity between the primer and the template. So if you look at the region that's complementary and you do the calculation of its melting temperature, then it's lower than the 60 degrees we have when you have full complementarity okay and then in this instance here I've shown a primer where um, it's identified 
a region of DNA, again, that's quite similar to the one we want to amplify, but it's a bit different in, in this region here. So we have perfect complementarity here, but then we have a region that doesn't match, and then we've got complementarity here. And again, if you do the simple maths to estimate its melting temperature, then it's lower than what of the it's lower than the melting temperature of the one that perfectly aligns. So again, this is a non-specific product, and we want we don't want the primer to bind there. This would be a non-specific product. We don't want that to bind. Therefore, we use a temperature that um, favors the, the the perfect match. All right, and the other thing you have to think about this is looking at say the forward primer all right and we're going to design a primer we're going to optim optimize its length um, include certain bases for um, efficiency and that's good for one primer but then we have to design another primer in the reverse direction and really you want this primer to have the same melting temperature because it's no use having one primer bound and the other one going oh, and having a different melting temperature so that it can't bind properly. You want to use one annealing temperature in the thermal cycling reaction that will anneal a forward primer and a reverse primer. So you need to carefully design the sequence of the reverse primer or adjust, just modify the length in either direction here of the um, reverse primer so that its annealing temperature matches that of the forward primer. And that's really important in PCR reactions. Okay. All right. Let's have a quick look again at the amplification of a template DNA sequence, this silly little animation I had earlier. And this time we're going to um, be looking at the actual temperatures we're using in a thermal cycling reaction. and look at how the process works. So in this little box here, I'm representing a thermal cycling reaction. So what we have here is denaturing the DNA for up to, up to five minutes. And that's not cycled, that's just a pre-heating um, step. And that's often included, particularly when you're working with genomic DNA, to melt the, um, the, the large template molecule thoroughly, okay? When you start thermal cycling, you just need these very short denaturing steps because you're um, denaturing much shorter regions of DNA, which is the product, you know, because it might only be a couple of thousand base pairs long and it's quite easy to melt that. It might need to be a hundred, a couple of hundred base pairs long. Okay, so we, I'll quickly go through this thing that we've talked about before, which is the repeated cycles of denaturing, annealing and extending. Then we'll talk about, um, or I'll just mention it here, that often at the end of a PCR reaction, you have an extension step, which is um, basically a repeat of the end of the thermocycling, but it's just extension for a couple of minutes. And I think this is a good step to include because at the end of, say, 30 cycles, your DNA polymerase has been heated and, and you know stressed out at 95 degrees temperature. 20, 30 times. So it might not be as, fish, as efficient as it was earlier on. Um, the number of nucleotides that we had to drive the process and, you know, that's, that, that are used, that are polymerized together to make DNA, those, the amount of nucleotides would have significantly dropped in the later stages of the PCR reaction because you've made product, you know, you've used up your substrates. And also the number of primers that were present early on has, has also dropped. So I, I, I'm assuming that in, in the late stages of the PCR reaction, it's not as efficient as it was in the early stages. You do this um, final extension, you give the polymerase more time to extend those amplified products right until the end of the sequence. And that also ensures that when you take that DNA to do other reactions, that you're, you can uh, hopefully assume that all of your products are, have been fully extended and uh, is double-stranded along the entire sequence. Okay, um, and then you can go off and do restriction digest and cloning and you know DNA treatment and, and lots of downstream um, applications following the PCR reaction. Let's look at this animation I had earlier and let's look at how the primers are working during the thermal cycling reaction.
Okay, so let's look at the first step of this um, PCR reaction. So initially we're doing this pre-denaturation. So we've got a large genomic DNA and we're putting a lot of heat into the system for maybe three, four, five minutes to, double, to denature the double-stranded DNA. Th th this denaturation then runs into the thermal s first thermal cycling step and clearly the first step of the thermal cycle is just an extra bit of denaturation, okay? We then go into the annealing step. So we're now going to take these um, primers and allow them to bind to the um, template DNA sequence. So we're not sure what the annealing temperature is when, we, when you're designing a PCR reaction. We've got a rough estimate, but you have to empirically run through a bunch of different temperatures and see which one works best. So, as we discussed earlier, these primers here that are matching the complementary, that are fully complementary to the template, will bind the most strongly. Okay, so they're most resistant to higher temperatures of, it, of denaturation. When you're, um, th these other uh, sequences of template DNA may have some complementarity to the primers, and you don't want to extend them, so you don't want them to anneal. Okay, so you don't um, run the annealing temperature at a lower temperature, you run it as, at a hi as high a temperature as you can. Okay, so assuming that this annealing temperature is high enough, you know, you won't see the annealing of the poorly matched primers. And then once you've optimized that, we then clearly going to run through the next step of the, the extension reaction. So you might have to run through an entire PCR reaction multiple times over many days and play around with this annealing temperature to work out at which temperature you're getting specific binding and therefore you're getting a specific product. Okay, and then once you've run through um, this thermal cycling reaction um, which has been optimized, once you've run through that you know, 20, 30 times and built up enough PCR product um, that, which, uh, as shown here, then we run through a last um, extension reaction just to allow the reaction to complete. Okay, I'd just like to finish off by discussing a couple of important points about um, the primers and some issues we, you need to think about. So the, the first thing we need to avoid with, with the primers is this, is this thing called primer dimers. Okay, so because we've got two um, primers, we want to avoid the primers being able to bind to each other. All right, because if, if you think about it, it'd be very easy if, if there's overlap at the three prime ends of the primers for them to um, base pair and then to be extended to form a product that we don't want, okay? so. Here's, here's a, a, an example of um, how the primers have been extended and the three prime end has been copied from the other primer. So if you can get, if you have binding between the primers rather than binding, which you don't want, but if this happens during the action and the primers become extended, then the important areas of the primers, which is the three prime ends, are now the wrong sequence, all right? So, um, if these were the original primers and the, the, these primers were able to bind to the complementary DNA, which is what you want, with extended primers, this might be complementary, but this region now, because this is copied from that, is complementary to the, the tail end of that, it no longer um, has any resemblance to the template sequence and similarly if this has been copied from there now this is no longer um, complementary to the template DNA so effectively that's going to shut down the ability of these primers to extend and bind um, and produce PCR product of the DNA sequence you want and it, it might bind elsewhere and produce more background noise Another thing when you're designing primers is at the um, it, it, is at the um, three primer end of the primer here for these bases here. 
it's often good to put um, G and C to, to find a sequence in the template that allows you to include G's and C bases at the ends of your primers that have um, strong Watson Creek um, base pairs then um, the idea is that that end of the primer is strongly locked down um, so that the polymerase can come along and begin the extension all right so again it's often good to um, put, put a what's called a GC clamp on the on the three prime end of your primer so that it, um, it anneals or you know complementary base pairs tightly with the sequence DNA sequence you're trying to amplify and makes it easier for the polymerase to extend the three prime end all right so I think I've covered most of the aspects of PCR that I can remember whilst I'm talking about these things, you know, as I am. So hopefully that helps you understand some of the background and some of the concepts of PCR and hopefully that makes it easier for you to um, think about and design and troubleshoot any PCR reactions that you might be um, carrying out. Okay, so thank you for listening. Appreciate your time and hopefully this um, has been useful for you. Okay, so till next time, thank you.